did you know that Google's artificial intelligence is just blowing your PPC ad budget? Hey, this is Jared Krause, host of the Buying Online Business and Podcast. And in this episode, I'm speaking with Frederick Valais. And he is a Silicon Valley entrepreneur, author, and leading influencer in pay per click search marketing. Now, Fred is one of Google's first 500 employees. He's helped pioneer PPC marketing as the company's first AdWords evangelist. And today, he serves as a co founder and CEO of Optimizer, a leading and award-winning PPC management platform. In this podcast episode, Fred and I start to talk about how he actually started working for Google and what he did in the decade that he was actually there working at Google in helping them build their PPC platform. We also talk about how advertising artificial intelligence is actually costing you a fortune. Uh, Fred also has a client who he helped save $50,000 every month that had one ad that I was spending 50 grand on that got no sales. So Fred can really help people save their money with their PPC ads. We also talk about why we should, as advertisers, understand how to be a PPC doctor and a PPC pilot. Fred explains what those are and how we can operate as the PPC doctor and the PPC pilot in our business when we're advertising. Fred also explains how digital marketing artificial intelligence is going to evolve and what we should do and be prepared for, um, for what Google is trying to do when they're making their ad platform better. We talk about so much more in this podcast episode as well. You're absolutely going to love it. Let's get stuck in. Today's episode is brought to us by Niche Website Builders, which is a company a few of my clients are using and have used for content creation and link building services. They do everything from start to finish. So from keyword research all the way to uploading your completed article for you. We've also had Bob members buy ready-made affiliate sites built by Niche Website Builders. So if you're looking to outrank your competitors' content and build better backlinks, Niche Website Builders and I have a special deal for you. Head to nichewebsite.builders forward slash Bob. I'll put a link in the show notes for you. But again, that's www.nichewebsite.builders forward slash Bob. Fred, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me, Jared. It's great to be here. Cool. So I want to dive into all things Google Ads, advertising, um, how we can grow our our e-commerce businesses uh, with, with Google Ads and all the cool things that are coming. But I know a lot of people are curious. Let's first start off with um, how you first started working with Google and what that experience was like and what you what you drew from that to to get to where you're at now, I guess. Yeah. I uh, So I started working at Google when it was really small still, a really small by today's standard. So it was about 500 people and they needed someone who spoke Dutch because they were taking Google AdWords into its sixth language at the time. Um, and so they, they were just looking across the Bay Area. Does anyone here speak Dutch? Raise your hand if you do. Um, a bunch of people <laughs> did, but I was the most like low key because some of the other people were like, yeah, I speak Dutch, but like, where's my office and where's my assistant? And that was totally not the Google mm-hmm. culture. And I was like, sure, I'll, I'll come do whatever you need me to do. Um, and th- this was like 2002. So I just lost my job and the, uh, the dot-com bubble had just burst. or was still on the way of deflating. Um, so yeah, when a tech company like Google came along, I was like, sure, give me anything and uh, I'll make it happen. And that was a really good move. And uh, I've been doing PPC advertising ever since. Um, stayed at Google about 10 years and then decided that there were some of the to, to the problems that advertisers were having that they just weren't going to solve. And so I started a company, mm. Optimizer, and that's what we do. We make advertisers' lives easier. We save them time and we help them get better results. Um, so I haven't been able to move out of the PPC space, but I love it. So were you still working at Google when you started Optimizer? No. So this was not a moonlighting gig, though uh, a lot of people tried that. And I, I did try some things as well. But what was interesting, um, my passion for PPC, I, you know, I had when I was in college, I dabbled in PPC. I was on goto.com. So this was back in 1998 when not a lot of people were doing PPC. And I was basically buying these video cassettes at Blockbuster. If anyone remembers that company, I had the VHS rentals. <laughs> But they would sell these cassettes mm-hmm. that were really expensive and they would sell them before they were supposed to. 
under contractual agreements. And so I would take these things and I would put them on eBay, but to drive more bids on my auctions, I was, uh, I was buying keywords with those movie names and then driving to my eBay listings. And so I was making enough money to like, you know, have a good time and, and buy some technology gadgets here and there, uh, but no huge money. Right. And I could never figure out how to make huge money until I go to Google and then we're in these meetings um, with the tier one support team. So the, the, all the support was steered by how much you spent. And uh, one of the tier one people comes in and is like, oh, all my customers, they're like mega affiliates. And I'm like, huh, if they're mega affiliates, like there must be something to this whole affiliate thing. So, so I went looking for affiliate programs that I could join and I started buying keywords for all of these companies. Um, so I was really big for eBay. I did car insurance. And, uh, and while I was an employee at Google helping to build the Google ad system, I was also one of its biggest advertisers using that system to generate leads for all these companies. And, and these companies, they hadn't seen the light yet. They, they were like, well, what's this whole PPC thing? Like some people are doing that, but not that many. Nobody understood it. And I just did it better. Um, and so, so the ways that I was able to do it better is I built conversion tracking before conversion tracking was a thing from Google. I built search terms reports before that became a thing from Google. And so that's always been what I wanted to do was figure out how these systems work, but where are the gaps and how do I fix these gaps so that advertisers can do better? And in the, the very beginning, it was I was the advertiser who I was building this technology for. And then Google started obviously building conversion tracking and all of these other things. Um, but then, then I said, okay, well, how do I take that to the next level? And that's how Optimizer came to be. So basically, you are the real optimizer. <laughs> you started out optimizing yourself oh, to yeah. get better results for PBC, right? And and through affiliates, um, you know, buying leads and stuff like that. So exactly. when when did you start running PBC ads for affiliates and lead generation? What what year was that? So I joined Google in two thousand and two. So shortly after I joined the company is when it became clear to me that that was a, a good thing to do. I know for sure by early 2003, because that's when I got a call from American Express and they were like, what's going on with your credit usage? Because it was spiking, right? Like I was buying these keywords that were brand names of big companies and they weren't competing on mm -hmm. these keywords yet. Um, and so I could literally spend $30,000 a day on these keywords. And American Express was like, well, are you going to pay us this money back? Because we've never seen you spend this much money on the credit card. Um, so that was an interesting conversation, but that's that's kind of when I started doing it. Yeah, okay. Cool. So you basically just leveraging, using leverage through the cards. Yeah, I mean, and it was, so I was basically arbitraging the fact that I could buy this traffic relatively cheaply on Google. And then these companies had mm -hmm. affiliate programs where they would pay me a much higher amount for each new customer that I brought in. Um, yeah, gotcha. And then the spread on the credit card. So, th and that wasn't really part of the game. I wasn't like floating the money, right? But that was certainly helpful. Though as an affiliate, remember, you usually don't get paid for a long time after you've done that conversion. So it was actually a bit problematic. And, and the fact that they didn't pay me for 60 days, but I had to pay my credit card before then, that was a bit of an issue. Yes. Um, and for anyone listening so to this and being like, hey, this is a, I should go and do that. Like that was 20 years ago. Like that's been done. Uh, that door has shut. Yeah. But there's other things you can do. Yeah, of course. Different, you know, lines of credit in your business and stuff. But this isn't, this isn't advice, um, investment advice. That's for sure. A little disclaimer in there for us. So has optimized, did you start optimizer with the intention to optimizing for optimizing PPC ads for affiliates and lead generation? Or, and if so, has that evolved into e-commerce? Like what's, what are most, so people that are, you know, optimizers for ad agencies, right? Not just e-commerce business owners. Is that right? Yeah. So optimizers for how we position it is for people who do PPC or digital advertising for a living. And they generally, they okay. know what they want to do, but they want to be more efficient. And they're frustrated generally by some of the limitations that Google puts in place. And that's kind of the light that I saw from being at Google, right? So Google has a million plus advertisers, uh, way more than that, mm -hmm. but you know they don't really share the numbers. But, but you, you got to build mm -hmm. a product for a million users and it has to work for all of them. And obviously some of these users are mm -hmm. novices, some of them are really advanced. And so, but Google has always had this philosophy, it has to work for everyone. So there's like these niche areas 
that are really important to the big advertisers that they just don't really build mm. out. Um, and that's frustrating, right? And, and even if I can get a small percentage of those advertisers to use some of my time-saving mm. software, like that's huge for them. They're saving, in some cases, like we got companies that are saving 10 headcounts, 10 full-time employees on something stupid yeah. manual they had to do that we can now do through software. And yeah. so those people can now actually be strategic and really add value to the business. I want to, I want to come back to, I want to, I want to bookmark uh, smart campaigns and different ways that Google are providing us the products or the, the objectives of these different ads and how that can make it harder for different businesses in different niches. But t- let's come back to the, uh, the head, the head count. So people are actually able to save on having 10 employees by optimizing something within their campaigns. What was that that they needed to optimize? So give us, give us an example of how that played out for this business. Yeah, I mean, so uh, the exact business is a really large uh, brand name in uh, sports and fashion. And they have a huge product catalog. And that catalog keeps changing like twice a week, there's new products being added, there's products going out of stock. They're running these products across uh, the globe, right? So they have different teams for Europe, but even within Europe, they have teams for different countries. Then they have those same teams in the Americas and Asia across the world. Um, And so what their challenge is, is when you run a shopping ad on Google, you wanna make sure that you're advertising things in the right place. And you wanna advertise the things you can actually sell. Now, keeping your inventory and what's, you know, every week coming into stock and matching that to the campaign where it needs to be in to have the right bid and the right landing pages and all the right settings and the right budgets, that's really tedious, right? So there's a new winter jacket. Okay, like which campaign is that in again? Because we got 50 campaigns running and they each have like a thousand ad groups. So this tool um, that Optimizer has built is is the, the, the shopping campaign builder and automator You basically tell us one time, okay, I want to structure my campaigns based on product category. And then I want to have an ad group for each like subcategory or or third level category. Or I want to have ad groups based on like the return on ad spend goal, based on profit margin, for example. So you just set that up once, the structure, and then the tool on a daily basis looks at, oh, what's new in the inventory and where does that go? And what stuff is no longer in inventory? So what does that mean for stuff mm-hmm. we have to pause so you're no longer wasting money on that? That alone is like saving huge amounts of time. Um, reports wow. is another good one. Like most agencies, right? We don't just work with agencies. It's in-house teams as well. But agencies, a big part of their job is telling their client, how did we do this month? Um, we had one agency that were spending four hours a month on each client to put together all the data, right? Put it into a template with us. We got really nice visualizations that are specific to to the Google ads, the Microsoft ads world. And, uh, you know, with the, you don't even have to like flick a button. It's basically automatically it runs and it sends that report to the customer. But one little nifty thing is you can put a, a threshold so you can say, oh, if my conversions have gotten lower versus last month, don't send it automatically to the customer because something's going on. That customer is going to be pissed. They're going to be asking questions. So let us take a look at that first. Let's understand what's happening and then communicate it. Um, And that's kind of the key difference, I think, right? There's there's many tools, there's many reporting software out there. But for us, Mm -hmm. we always went at it from people who manage Google ads accounts primarily because let's see, let's face it, that's the biggest place where people spend money online when it comes to digital advertising. Like if we can make that better, that's going to have a huge impact on businesses. And then from there, we started adding capabilities for Amazon ads, Microsoft ads, Facebook ads, right? But it was always about like within the platform, with the data from the platform, how do we make things more efficient for you? Let's move into uh, optimizing ads. So for somebody who has an e-commerce business and they say they're spending, you know, 10K a month or whatever, and that may be small for using the the tool, although the tool's not that expensive, really, um, when I went and had a look at it. How, you know, how do, how should we be optimizing? This is a very, very broad, but say for an e-commerce business that's selling a product and they've got maybe four main products, how should they be optimizing their campaigns? Because we've got smart campaigns in mm-hmm. Google that can take out some of the customization, right? But you provide better customization 
for more specific campaigns. So what should we be doing as e-commerce business owners to be able to get better results with our, with our ads through customizing it the right way? What are some of the things that we should right. be looking for and doing? Exactly. When you talk about shopping and e-commerce, you're talking about smart shopping campaigns or regular shopping campaigns. Mm-hmm. And so that's a distinction Google draws. The smart shopping campaign, there's not a whole lot of settings. They're ideal for someone who doesn't really want to deal with the, the complexity and it provides good enough results, right? But if you want to take it to that next level, now you're talking about regular shopping campaigns where you have access to all the bells, the whistles, the dials, all the different settings. Now, the first question I would ask is, what's the difference between these products? Do they all have different margins? Is there different seasonality? Is there another sort of like business driver that impacts what sells when and how much profit we get for it? That's really the first question because that's going to help you decide how do you structure things out. Now, if you got a simple situation, all of your products have the same margin, they all have the same seasonality. I mean, put them all in one campaign, put one target return on ad spend on it, and you can basically be done. But the reality is it probably varies. It, it, it differs for different products. Um, and so now you're going to start saying, okay, well, maybe I need to have one campaign for my high margin products and a different one for my low margin products. And then I can set different target return on ad spends for each of these that help me at the very least break even and grow my business, but ideally also drive a lot of profit for me, right? But you have to have different targets to achieve profitability if you have different margins. Um, so, so that's probably the first place where I would start. Now, also, I, I'm talking about target return on ad spend. So let's maybe explain that a bit because, because I'm not, not yes. sure everyone knows about smart bidding, right? But uh, Google has become much more automated than it was even like a couple of years ago. So most advertisers, if we look at our advertisers, there's probably 99% of them who use some form of automated bidding from Google today. So the days of manually setting up your bids, like that's done. Nobody does that anymore, yeah. right? But yes. automated bidding doesn't mean you'd set it and forget it. It just means that there's certain things that you, you had to do before Google now handles, but you still mm-hmm. got to think about like, what's my target? And it's no longer a target CPC or a maximum CPC, but it's a target return on ad spend, a target uh, cost per acquisition. Um, so like, how do you set that? And that usually then depends it's, on campaigns and ad groups. Yeah, there's there's so much within the Google ads platform. And then there's going to be so much within Optimizer that you can use to customize your ads. And I, from what I gather is that Google is going very general using AI and then Optimizer is a great tool to allow you to get better customization of your ads so you can get better results. I want to ask you a, a very broad question around this. How is AI changing digital marketing in, in Google ads or how is it changing the digital marketing world? Like, yeah, it's, like you talk about with these smart campaigns, automated bidding, this is a big, I think this is a big thing for people to understand because there can be a lot of money left on the table just by going with the recommended um, automated suggestions that Google has. Yeah. Well, it, it's a great question. And so I wrote a book, um, um, but I got a new one coming out on Level the Playing Field. It's coming out in January. And it's really, it's about the biggest mind shift in digital marketing. And AI is, is obviously one of the biggest things that's happened, not just in digital marketing, but in general, right? Like everything, the war, mm-hmm. self-driving cars, they couldn't happen without some form of AI. Like all these business decisions that get made, AI is driving these. Mm-hmm. Um, but really, we have to remember that like you said, you can leave a lot of money on the table if you just take the default recommendations because these AIs are in some way generalized systems that look at patterns, um, but they, they don't look at the patterns as they relate to your business, right? So they might know things mm-hmm. like, oh, well, what's the conversion rate for your company depending on whether somebody's coming on a mobile device or a desktop and depending on the time of day and the location that they come from. So all of these signals that Google has. But what if you sell car batteries and you know that the first day that it's freezing, that you have frost overnight, that's when a lot of car batteries are going to die. So the next morning, Mm. that's when your budgets, you know, you got to double them. You got to triple them because what you usually spend, like you're going to double that that day because there's going to be so many dead batteries and people looking to get them fixed that day. Google doesn't know that, right? I mean, maybe Google knows it, but that's a 
fairly big assumption and not one that we can rely well, on. They, haven't, they may have not have built that into the AI for if you're like, hey, because your business is, you know, the, 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 the temperature of the location that you're selling in has changed. That's probably not built in to the AI, right? Exactly. Um, I guess it's not. I don't know that for sure. Um, but again, it, it's like yeah. those things where you, you they're so specific to your business that you can only assume mm-hmm. Google's probably not looking at that quite yet. And so the worst that you can do is you can give them that signal and now they're double counting that signal, right? But okay, fine, whatever. Then they triple or quadruple my budget instead of doubling it. But that's great because I'm going to sell more car batteries anyway. That's a much better problem to have mm-hmm. than like completely missing that opportunity. Um, and so that that's one of those roles that humans have to play, um, right? So you're basically a teacher to the machine. That's a that's an interesting way to look at it in terms of a mental model. You you you're a, you're a feature to the machine of Google Ads that allows the customization, which is where your tool comes in. What are some of the other things that where AI is allowing us as advertisers to leave money on the table. So that's one example, but what are some other other examples that we should be thinking about? Because I think if we give people multiple use cases of how they could be leaving money on the table, it's going to open their eyes to see that smart campaigns and different campaigns may not actually be getting the results they want. And it can also mean the difference between them being profitable or not as well. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, other places where people leave money on the table with AI, is, um, you know, budgets. So people think that the AI is automatically going to bid the right amount, but there's this thing called impression share loss due to rank and due to budget in Google ads. Um, If you've got really conservative targets for your target cost per acquisition or your target return on ad spend, you could actually be looking at 50% of the opportunity being lost, right? but because you're in an automation wow. sort of mindset, you think, well, Google's figuring this out. Like, what do I need to do? But if you still monitor these things and then so you see, oh, my God, 50 percent of my opportunities being lost. Now you can ask questions like, is my target incorrect? Am I being too conservative in how I've done this? And then you can ask questions like, am I being too conservative? Because maybe my conversion rate optimization projects haven't been set up correctly. Right. If you're doing lead gen and you get. conversion rate on the page versus 20%. Well, that's a huge impact on how aggressive you can be with your bids. And if your competitors are doing this, well, then they're eating your lunch, basically. They're taking away those top positions. And Google's gotten much more competitive too. They used to have all these ads on the right-hand side of the page. Now it's really focused on top of page results. Um, So if you're not in those top three, four results, you're just not going to be that visible. Um, and, and so kind of the other two roles that we say that people have to play in this more automated world is uh, so there's the PPC doctor who remedies problems and also knows about interactions. Right. A, and I can talk much more about that in a minute if you want. Um, and then there's the PPC yeah, sure. pilot and the PPC pilot just looks at anomalies. It's like, by the way, did you know that the average pilot flies a plane 11 minutes per flight? But the reason they're there is wow. if something goes wrong, yeah. they can take control and they know what to do. And that's what we need to do as well because Google does break sometimes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so you're basically sitting in the cockpit just in case something needs attention. So let's talk about what a, a PPC doctor is and then let's move on to what a, a PPC pilot is so people can understand what roles they have to play with their own ads. Yeah, so, so a PPC doctor, um, so when you go to the doctor, they're supposed to diagnose your problem and then have a bunch of solutions for you. Uh, but they also, they ask you questions about interactions, right? So what medication do you already take? Because what they're going to prescribe depends on what you're already doing. Um, so I, I like to liken this to in digital marketing. There's this whole notion of last click attribution or attribution models. And an attribution model is basically just saying, if you get a conversion or you get a successful event happening with your business, who do you give credit to for that thing having happened? Now, over the last two decades in digital marketing, the standard has been last click attribution. And that means that me, if I do 15 searches that eventually lead up to me buying something, only the last thing I searched gets any of that credit. Now, Mm. here's an example. Say that you sell sneakers, 
uh, say you're Adidas and you sell Ultra Boost, the 22s just came out. So someone does all of these searches. They eventually go to Ultra Boost 22 uh, in a size 10 and a half. They buy that product. Now that gets all the credit. If I'm advertising for Adidas and somebody tells me the keyword sneakers, which is upper funnel, right? So it's never the thing that gets the conversion right afterwards. It's the thing that drives you down the path of looking for more specific things. Yeah. And if they say that gets no credit, no conversions, I'm not stupid. I'm not going to turn off that keyword because I know that's a huge part of their business. But if you're a computer and you're doing automated bidding, you're like, well, I mean, the advertiser told me last click attribution. So this thing has no value. So I'm just going to turn it off or I'm going to bid really low for it. And guess what happens next month? Well, your funnel goes from being really wide to really narrow and fewer conversions come out at the bottom. Um, And that's a huge mistake you can make. And as a PPC doctor, you know that that's the way not to do it. Because those other things, those other key words could actually be more valuable than the last click attribution. They're instrumental in getting people down the funnel. Exactly. And so now, luckily, Google has recently changed to a data-driven attribution becoming the standard. And so this this is Mm. really sophisticated. And it's, again, AI, machine learning-driven models. But they can start to understand, oh, well, if the user did a search for sneakers and then for, uh, you know, running shoes and then for lifestyle sneakers, how much did each of these things contribute to the end result, which was somebody buying a pair of sneakers? Yeah, yeah, gotcha. That makes sense. That's really good. And then so let's talk about the pilot, the difference between a, so a doctor is basically diagnosing the problem and it sounds like a pilot's just running this running the system making sure it's it's running the way it's supposed to run would that be the correct yeah exactly be about monitoring so i think one of the primary things you as a ppc pilot would do is set up alerts and figure out what do we need to carefully monitor so again let's take Mm -hmm. bidding because this is one of the most common things that advertisers automate so you've got automated bidding target return on ad spend um, and, and by the way, what that means is like how much value in sales needs to be driven for each dollar of advertising spend that you do, right? So you set a target on that. It's usually expressed mm-hmm. as a percentage. Um, but Google then does all this portfolio management and they, they're bidding different things for different keywords. And at the end of the day, like your campaign in general kind of comes close to having reached that target return on ad spend. But for certain brief periods of time, in fact, this happened about three weeks ago, uh, the Google shopping campaign system was broken. And all of a sudden, the bids for shopping ads were going up really dramatically. You end up being stuck with a bill, and Google is refunding some of that because it was a bug. Um, but what if it hadn't been a bug and it was a competitor coming in causing this to happen for you, right? You can set up alerting systems that say, well, sure, we're doing target return on ad spend bidding, but I still want to know when my average cost per click goes above $10 for a click because... Historically, maybe you've tried that and you've seen that that's too much. At the very least, you want to know about it, right? So get an email alert, go look at the account, figure out what's going on. Um, We've also seen cases where all of a sudden the conversion rate system reports that conversions are going way down. And what does the automated bidding system do? Well, it says that I'm going to bid lower and lower and lower because my conversion rate is dropping. So I can't afford to pay quite as much for all of these clicks. Uh, Next thing you know, they figure out that the website was down, right? There was nothing wrong with people wanting to buy your stuff. They wanted to buy it, but they couldn't. Um, and now, but the automated system that's doing the bidding thought that your conversion rate was bad when in fact it was just the website was down. So the moment you brought the website back online, you should have told the bidding system, ignore all of this data from the last six hours because it's invalid. It doesn't matter. Yes. Um, that's what the pilot does. They look at like, what's the real cause of the thing? And how do we get the machine to get back on track? Yeah, right. Wow. Okay. This when I think about it now, we've just basically opened a whole can of worms. Oh yeah. Of how many things can happen with our campaigns through AI with with AI and targeting and different campaigns that can just allow us to or not even understand how much money we're leaving on the table. We're going to have to maybe have a bigger conversation around this in maybe another podcast or something like that. But I'd love to. I want to ask, where do you see where do you see Google Ads and AI evolving, and, and what else should we be prepared for that may be coming? Yeah, I mean, so 
there's a story that goes way back to my earlier days at Google. Eric Schmidt, who was the CEO at the time, um, he every week on Fridays, there was this TGIF meeting, the whole company, the two founders, and then CEO Eric Schmidt. Um, and at one point he got up on stage and he was like, you know, the ideal vision, the end vision for Google ads is that the advertiser comes to us, tells us uh, what their goal is and gives us a blank check. And we go and make that happen for them, right? Mm. That's sort of the the end game for AdWords and they are getting somewhat closer. And it's, it's a bit of a scary vision to give a blank check. But I think the fundamental shift yes. that advertisers have to do is they have to stop managing the details and start managing the communication of the things they care about and goals and values, right? So we've, we've spent too many decades worrying about exactly what keyword and what bid we want, when what we really should be focused on today is communicating to Google when something good happened, how much that was worth to us, and you know then how much more of that we want to get. If we do a good job with that, then we can steer the machine learning system uh, in, in doing more of that good stuff. And again, an, an example here is if you do lead gen and you try to get leads for your business, you've been doing manual bidding, manual optimization, all of that before. Now you transition to doing it automatically through Google, which is very easy to set up. Um, but then you look at your leads are going up, your target, your cost per acquisition for those leads is going down. So everything should be good, right? You're paying less, you're getting more. But then you look at the state of the business at the end of the month and they've actually sold fewer things, even though you had more leads. So what's the problem? Well, the problem is that you told Google oh, you wanted leads. leads, but you don't want leads, you want customers, right? So you have to redefine wow. how you inform Google because the machine is only as good as the information that you put into it. If you don't tell it what you want, it's yeah. going to do stuff that you can't control. It can give you it can give you 100 leads that aren't as qualified as the type of leads that you actually want that are going to allow you to get the conversions as well because where are those leads coming from like we're talking about with different keywords right exactly it's, that's amazing that's amazing to think about so you're saying communicate better what's more important to our business with our advertisers basically exactly so it's again like what eric was saying back then which is tell us what you want but don't lie about it don't like hide details because the machine, yeah. when it doesn't have the details, it can get you the thing you really want. And there's a trust factor, right? And so I did work at Google for a decade. Um, and there was the whole mantra of don't be evil, which they got rid of. And they didn't get rid of it because they all of a sudden became evil. But it was more that, you know, everybody's reading so much into it. And it's like this whole thing you now have to defend. And it becomes like this whole philosophical mm -hmm. debate. But, you know, Google thrives when advertisers have growing businesses, when they are successful. And guess what? I mean, advertisers can go to Facebook. They can go to other platforms. They they could go and spend money on TV again, right? But advertisers want to grow their business. The place that does it best is where they're going to invest more money. So that's Google. That's all Google wants is they want to um, give you the best true conversions for the lowest possible price. And that's why they're building these systems. The systems are not perfect, so they need monitoring. We call that concept automation layering, by the way, right? So we we put systems in place through Optimizer that monitor these automations from Google to steer them in the right direction. Um, but yeah, that's that's what it's all about is just taking back control. Yeah, taking back control. I think that's absolutely critical. And underst understanding more about your business and then communicating that so you can, can take back more control. Where can we find out more about Optimizer, Fred? Yeah, optimizer.com, uh, the O-P-T-M-Y-Z-R. There's no E in optimizer. Uh, autocorrect always yeah, messes that up why. if people can even remember it. Uh, domain names were a bit hard to come by when we started the company, so it is what it is. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you can also cool, look for cool. a PPC management software and we'll usually pop up somewhere. Awesome. Good work on getting that ranking. So Fred, you have a new book. It's just been published Congratulations. Uh, what's in the book briefly and where can we go away and um, grab this? Yeah, thank you. It's Unlevel the Playing Field, the biggest mind shift in PPC history. Um, so a lot of the stuff we talked about today, it's taking those concepts and kind of building on it and giving very tactical examples of how you can unlevel the playing field. Because honestly, the biggest fear I think that I hear from advertisers is if everyone has access to the same automation from Google, 
how do I stand out? How do I remain competitive? Mm -hmm. And there are definitely ways you can do it. And that's what the book is about. So it's on Amazon. It's a Kindle, audiobook, print, whatever you want. Go to Amazon, unlevel the playing field, and uh, you should find it. Thank you so much for coming on, Fred. For everybody that is listening, thank you so much for listening. If you are running ads, doesn't matter where, specifically if you are running on Google, but this will be related to many different advertising platforms as well with the AIs that they build, is make sure you share this episode with two or three people who are running ads or are going to be running ads for their business. So they're not leaving money on the table either. Thanks for listening, guys, and I'll see you on the next one. Hey, YouTube watcher. If you thought that video was good, you should check out this video here on the two best types of websites beginners should buy. Or check out my playlist on how I made my first 100K from buying websites and how to do due diligence. Check it out. It's an awesome playlist. You'll enjoy it.